Because the Dutch Republic was politically so unlike the other countries of Europe at this time, which had real consequences for the art world, I need to go into some detail about its origins. The seven united provinces of the Netherlands became a republic almost accidentally. They broke away from Spain during the Eighty Years' War, the one that began in 1568. And after the assassination in 1584 of their leader, William the Silent, Prince of Orange, they were left without a noble leader for the country. Eventually, they settled on a government through their Central Council of Provinces that was called the States General, while military leadership went to the descendants of William the Silent. Holland, by the way, is just one of the provinces, but even in the 17th century, it was the most powerful. And that is why people have often come to calling the entire country by the name of that one province. Even before the final peace treaty was signed at Münster in 1648, the Dutch Republic had become an economic powerhouse in Europe, with Amsterdam serving as the financial center for the continent and Dutch trade dominating the North Atlantic. It was officially a Calvinist state, but Lutherans, Jews, and other Protestant groups were welcome to practice their faith openly. Roman Catholics had to do so in private, but the government generally looked the other way. And in certain cities, as much as a quarter of the population remained Roman Catholic. Many immigrants came from the Spanish Netherlands to the north, including Protestants that were no longer welcome in the southern provinces after 1587, and others who simply saw greater economic uh, possibilities in the north. The new country flourished, and both the urban bourgeoisie and the rural farmers were generally prosperous until the 1670s. Then wars with France following ones with England sapped the strength and resources of the Dutch Republic. It would never again regain the economic and artistic glory that it had in the 17th century. The influence of Calvinism on the art world was significant. Almost all religious images were banned from Calvinist churches, and the most rigorous Calvinists would even have frowned on them in private homes. The House of Orange in The Hague had a modest court, uh, and its art patronage was limited in scale. What did this mean? Well, the two most traditional areas for uh, patronage, therefore, were unavailable to most 17th century Dutch artists. They adapted to the switch situation quickly, though, and developed the largest open art market in Europe, with artists specializing in certain subjects and selling them ready-made directly to the public. Art and economic historians argue about how many paintings were made in the Dutch Republic during the century, but they agree that the number ran into the millions. It's just a question of how many millions. These were well-crafted paintings at various price points to meet a diverse public. Since most of these paintings uh, were not commissioned, we have little documentary evidence about the works in general. So my approach in these lectures on Dutch art will be to show more paintings to indicate the variety of works made, but I will discuss each uh, only briefly. At the beginning of the 17th century, history painting still was popular in the Dutch Republic. Joachim Outeval was a group, among a group of Dutch painters who developed a style based on mannerism, but adapted it for their native clientele. Outeval, whose dates were 1566 to 1638, worked in the town of Utrecht, a former Roman Catholic bishopric. He was a member of the Calvinist town council and a flax merchant as well as a painter. Many Dutch artists had more than one career in the 17th century. The Judgment of Paris is signed and dated 1615 and is on panel. We know the subject from Rubens's depiction of it, but Outeval's added in the background the earlier moment of the story, the actual wedding banquet of Peleus and Thetis, where the apple of discord was introduced by Eris, who was angered by her exclusion from the celebration. So we see that happening off in the background on the right side of the painting. The style recalls earlier works we've seen by Mannerist painters in the elongated and very elegant nudes, the complex pose of Paris in the foreground, and the playing with spatial perceptions where various planes seem to flatten on the surface. The colors are bright and applied smoothly. Outeval would have been exposed to Mannerism firsthand, both in France, he went to Fontainebleau, and in Italy. 
At this relatively late date, however, Autoval was probably more influenced by stimuli closer at hand. The town of Harlem had a thriving Mannerist group in the 1580s and 1590s. There, Hendrik Goltzius produced engravings in a Mannerist style. Both Minerva and the figure of the river god that is in the foreground of Autoval's painting were derived from Goltzius's large and famous engraving at the time, The Wedding of Cupid and Psyche, from 1587. Autoval can be described as an old-fashioned painter in his continuing devotion to mannerism decades after it was out of style elsewhere, including in Harlem. But after 1600, he modified the style by including naturalistic elements. Thus, we see here the shells, goats, dog, and flowers in the foreground that all suggest he studied them directly from nature. Because of Utrecht's former status as a bishopric, many of its artists continue to travel to Italy for part of their training, which became unusual elsewhere in the Dutch Republic. The generation of Utrecht painters after Outval became followers of Caravaggio, as seen in the works of Gerrit van Honthorst, whose dates were 1592 to 1656. Van Honthorst went to Rome sometime after 1610. A Catholic, he remained there until 1620 and enjoyed unusual success for a foreign painter. In Rome, he was called Gerardo della Notte, Gerard of the Night, since he preferred to paint nocturnal scenes, which, unlike Caravaggio's own works, contained light sources, often candles. Von Honthorst returned to Utrecht in 1620 and maintained a large workshop there that served an international clientele. The National Gallery owns three paintings by von Honthorst. We will look at one, St. Sebastian, probably painted about 1623, a few years after his return to Utrecht. This is quite a different interpretation from the one we saw in the 15th century by the Puyolo brothers and entirely within the Caravaggist mode. Instead of a group of figures, we see just one, the saint himself. He is tied to a tree, and we see that his body has been pierced by four arrows, arms, torso, and leg. The arrow in his right thigh leaves a trail of blood on his leg, a delicate, oddly beautiful trace. St. Sebastian's head has taken on a grayish pallor from loss of blood that contrasts with his warmer-toned torso. Behind him, plants shade our view, guiding our attention back to the saint. His figure is more evenly lit than would be true of many earlier Caravaggio's paintings. These elements speak to the phenomenon of Dutch naturalism, which became the dominant mode in the 17th century and had several sources. Yet von Honthorst tended to idealize his figures, and it must be said that Sebastian's suffering looks rather calm, even beautiful. This is nonetheless a fine painting and a skillful composition. Note how Sebastian's arms tied to the tree stretch out to cover much of the top part of the canvas and the delicate arc formed by his left side. The popular style of Dutch Caravaggism was used for genre scenes as well as for history subjects. You may recall that Caravaggio's first paintings were also genre scenes, several of them showed musical groups. Another painter who was strongly affected by Caravaggism was Hendrik Ter Bruggen, his dates 1588 to 1629. The National Gallery owns three of his paintings. Like, Hantor, like von Honthorst, Ter Bruggen trained in Utrecht and then traveled to Rome for a number of years. We don't know when he arrived, but he was back in Utrecht by the end of 1614. Unlike von Honthorst, he was a Protestant, not a Catholic. The concert from about 1626 shows how this popular style was used in the Netherlands as well as in Italy for genre painting. There's something wonderfully reticent about Terbruggen's style. For instance, the two figures closest to us are seen from the side and their costume blocks our entry into the painting. Unlike Caravaggio, this Dutch artist did not want our world and the painted world to unite despite the bowl of grapes that seems to mediate the border of the two realms. Tebruchen's chiaroscuro is pronounced. Note the inclusion of the candle here, something he may have taken from von Hontors. But it is also a soft chiaroscuro, a product of the beautiful muted color scheme. 
Terbruchen often preferred to use paler tones of blue, yellow, and mauve in ways that made his paintings distinctive. His figure style wasn't as idealizing as von Hontorf's, but we sense that these figures have thoughts as well as actions. The woman is particularly intriguing in that regard. Von Hontorf also painted concert scenes, but their atmosphere was typically more vivacious. The subdued mood of Terbruchen's painting makes it hard to see this as having any kind of negative message about the connection between music and lovemaking. Indeed, despite the theme of music, this is a quiet painting. The influence of the Utrecht Caravaggist painters traveled beyond their city and affected artists who never went to Italy. Franz Hals provides an excellent example. Hals, whose dates were about 1580 to 1666, was born in Antwerp, but his family settled in Harlem by 1591. There, Hals trained with Karl von Mander, the biographer and painter I have referred to before, and joined the Painters Guild in 1610. He would remain in Harlem for the rest of his long career. Hals specialized in portraits, single portraits, pair portraits, group portraits, but he also painted genre scenes uh, near the beginning of his career. Hals's young man holding a skull, probably painted in the 1620s, shows his affinity with Caravaggism in the half-length figure and costume of this young dandy, the hand reaching out towards us through the picture plane, and even the chiaroscuro, including the strong shadow on the back wall. Yet its overall tonality is lighter than many Dutch Caravaggio's paintings, and Hals's signature brushwork applied in confident separate strokes separates him from the style of von Honthorst or Terbruchen. While the subject at first looks to be modern, this young man in a feathered cap was probably based on an engraving by the Dutch artist Lucas von Leiden from about 1519. In both cases, the skull is meant to remind us that even the liveliest young person is mortal and will someday die. Works of art with such warnings about the inevitability of death are called vanitas images, using the biblical dual sense of vanity to mean something that is in vain as well as something that is worldly. Scholars point to the phrase in the book of Ecclesiastes, vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, all is vanity. There were certainly strong voices in the Netherlands in this era insisting that art should have a moral purpose. Yet did everyone necessarily read this vibrant painting by Hals as a moral lesson? This is exactly the kind of question that haunts the scholar of Dutch art. Hals is best known as a portrait painter, and the National Gallery owns seven Hals portraits, showing the range of his compositional types. I would like to take a quick look at one that seems deceptively simple, his portrait of a woman with a fan from about 1640. This painting is not dated, but we can give it an approximate date because of the woman's costume, which changed at a faster rate in the 17th century than earlier. Nor is the woman identifiable by the provenance of the painting or any documentary evidence. But her jewelry, clothing, and fan held very elegantly by the sitter, certainly indicate her affluence. Consider how much Hals does with so little here. We can claim this is a black and white painting because of her dress, but look at all the tones of gray created where we see the lace collar lying over the black dress itself. Hals carefully balanced the composition so that the intricate costume details do not take over from the sitter. Strong light on her face makes her head seem to come forward in space. The sitter's slight smile, set off by a few notable brush strokes, makes her approachable, but her gaze does not quite engage ours. She is a respectable matron, after all. We see Hals's vivacity of style in the application of highlights to her costume, but her face was painted with more restraint, answering to a general preference for a smooth appearance for female portraits. Such a portrait explains exactly why Hals was so popular with the well-to-do patrons of Harlem. One more portrait deserves our attention, for it is a portrait type that is somehow quintessentially Dutch. The author of it was Gerard Ter Bork, whose dates were 1617 to 1681, who is from a provincial town called Zwolle. He settled in the town of Deventer in the 1650s, though he also spent time in Amsterdam especially in the 1670s. 
Ter Bork was an accomplished portraitist, but is better known today for genre paintings. The National Gallery owns five paintings by him, both portraits and genre scenes. Gerard Ter Bork's portrait of a young man from about 1663 to 1664 shows an elegantly, I would say even foppishly dressed man standing between a red velvet chair and a table covered with the same red fabric. He is seen full length and Ter Bork has painted this work with his usual meticulous style, quite different from Franz Hals. And what we see here is almost a series of diamond shapes of the costume proceeding out from the waist down here to the ankles. Nothing in reproduction would seem unusual about this painting. It is a fine, careful study of a well-to-do patron, but it is not life-size or half-size or anything near it at a little over 26 inches by 21 inches. What we have here is a mini-man. Now, this makes sense, given the limited space in the homes of even well-to-do Dutch burghers. They were not building large town palaces to live in. But there is also something about the culture of this time that shied away from too much self-aggrandizing. Ter Bork's solution, which was a popular one, given how many of these full-length, small-scale portraits by uh, him still survive, was in keeping with this culture. This portrait of a man turned to his left likely had a mate, and there is a portrait in the Cleveland Museum of Art that matches it well in size, the age of the sitter, the date of the costume, and the composition. Sadly, too many Dutch couples from the 17th century are broken up in the current age. Genre subjects grew steadily in popularity in the Dutch Republic through the century and have remained so ever since. While many of them, but not necessarily all of them, have moralizing messages, they often get across their points with humor. Nicholas Maas, whose dates were 1634 to 1693, was an assistant in Rembrandt's workshop in Amsterdam about 1650. The National Gallery owns seven paintings by Maas, portraits and genre subjects. We will look at one of the latter. The idle servant, signed and dated 1655, is certainly moralizing, but with a light touch. In the foreground, a standing woman points to another woman who sleeps in a chair, dishes piled up on the floor in front of her. Behind the sleeping woman, a cat makes off with a duck from the pantry ledge. At our left, our gaze travels up a staircase to another room in the background where we see two women and a man seated at a table. But what does this all mean? The standing woman who smiles and points at the sleeping servant is likely the mistress of the household, judging by her costume, which indicates affluence. It is her job to keep all on task, and her pose and smile set up a relationship with the viewer. We know that not all is well in the scene, and the mistress must now set things right. But what is the relationship of the scene in the foreground to the one upstairs? Is that an example of proper behavior from a higher social class, or is something amiss there, too? This is where Maz's message becomes more elusive for us, and perhaps even for his contemporaries. There was a certain open-ended possibility in interpretation. We saw that happening in Venetian 16th century painting already. At the least, we can take pleasure in the rich, warm red tones that make up such an attractive painting, and its point about human nature. Maza's interest in depicting genre scenes in convincing and complex interior spaces would serve as a powerful example to slightly younger artists working in Delft. One of these artists was Peter de Hoek, whose dates were 1629 to 1684, who worked in Delft at the same time as Vermeer and later worked in Amsterdam. There are five de Hoek paintings in the National Gallery. Courtyard of a House in Delft, signed and dated 1658, is really the quintessential de Hoek painting. While he includes anecdotal elements, one senses it is really the harmonious balance of the human figures with architecture that pleases him most. It's a pretty satisfying emphasis for the modern viewer as well. A young woman and a child are poised on a step, preparing to leave the house for the outer world. Unseen by them, a more expensively dressed woman stands in a parallel passageway that leads to the outside world. She gazes ahead at the street and canal that are in front of her. This painting hints at various subjects, the role of different social classes, 
the socialization of young women and girls into their customary gender roles, the association of women with enclosed and domestic spaces. But meaning here is further complicated by a plaque that could be seen still in 17th century Delft. The Dutch translates as, this is St. Jerome's veil. If you wish to repair to patience and meekness, for we must first descend if we wish to be raised. The St. Jerome or Hieronymus cloister was a Catholic religious institution suppressed after the rise of Calvinism in the 16th century. But this plaque that once marked the entrance to the cloister could be seen into hoax time and in fact is still there today. Many Dutch genre scenes are about the lives of women and children, and one could see how this saying might apply to their social roles. But to Hoke made another version of the painting, still including the plaque, but with the architecture slightly changed, and the young woman and girl displaced by two men drinking at a table being waited on by a young woman. How do we apply the same message to them? Are they descending through bad behavior that will necessitate their being raised up? Or perhaps this plaque was really more of a sign of the locale, that this is a Delft image, whether real or, as in this case, transformed in the mind of the artist. Delft was a center for architectural painting and painting that engaged with the relationship of human activity and human spaces. De Hoek's famous contemporary, Johannes Vermeer, worked in Delft for his entire career. Vermeer, whose dates were 1632 to 1675, was the son of a silk weaver in Delft, which was then a center for luxury arts. His teacher isn't known, and he may have trained in either Delft or Utrecht. He entered the Delft Guild in 1653, which he served as an administrator twice in his career. Vermeer painted few works, around 35 still exist, and he may have worked for specific patrons. Young woman standing at a virginal from about 1670 or 72 was painted in the blue and yellow tones Vermeer so favored. Like de Hoek, Vermeer created a sense of exactitude in tracing the fall of light through the windows, across objects, the wall, and the figure of a woman who stands here as still as all the objects in the painting. She is at a virginal, a keyboard instrument, which contained Vermeer's signature on its side. A chair turned sideways blocks our physical entry into the room, but the young woman looks directly at us, inviting our response. Vermeer was fond of depicting paintings within paintings. Here we see a landscape framed in the newer French style with a gilded frame, while next to it a large painting with a more traditional Dutch black frame shows Cupid holding up a card or a tablet. Even the virginal is decorated with a landscape scene. Are these pictures clues to interpretation? Some have read the Cupid figure as reflecting a contemporary image in a book of love emblems where Cupid holds up a tablet with the number one on it and the accompanying verses advocate loving one only. But here, Vermeer's Cupid holds up an empty tablet. The painter seems to tantalize us with the possibility of meaning and frustrate our attempts to arrive at a soul meaning simultaneously. I think this is really part of the appeal of Vermeer. So we are left simply to admire the beautiful representation of light and shade on the crisp folds of the woman's dress and take in all the small details, Dutch tiles on the baseboard, panes of glass in the window, with pleasure. From a distance, the decoration of the young woman's dress looks as if it is finely detailed, but close up, these details dissolve into blotches and spots of paint, reminding us that this is truly all an illusion. And we might think of Velazquez here as well. It is a geometric world created by Vermeer with rectangles on the floor, walls, and in the windows, firmly embracing this young woman who plays her instrument and looks to greet us forever. Another quality of this painting is its relative silence. Again, despite the fact she seems to be playing music, everything seems quite still here. And we have to contrast that with the fact that we know Vermeer had a household full of children and lots of noise around him. We can see how an artist truly does create an alternate universe. The order of Vermeer can be contrasted with the typically rambunctious, disorderly world of Jan Steen, 
whose dates were 1626 to 1679. Born in Leiden, Stain had a restless career. In the mid-1650s, he ran a brewery in Delft and from 1672 had an inn in Leiden. Such haunts may have been helpful to him in his many genre paintings that explore, explored human weakness with humor and even empathy. But he also painted portraits and history scenes. The National Gallery owns 10 paintings by Stain, all genre subjects. The effects of intemperance from about 1663 to 1665 is about the cascading consequences of indulgence in alcohol. The mistress of the house, we see her at the left, is in a drunken sleep, and as a result, everyone around her misbehaves. Children at the right allow a cat to eat a meat pie, while a well-dressed young lady offers wine to a parrot. Food is wasted, just scattered on the steps, while a young man throws roses before a pig. And this is the Dutch equivalent of our saying about wastefulness, tossing pearls before swine. They talked about throwing roses before swine. One child in the background at the left even reaches into the drunken woman's open money bag to steal the household funds. The final consequences of such behavior, that would be poverty, as indicated by the beggar's basket and crutch hanging over the woman on the wall behind her. Meanwhile, at the right in the background, another woman holding a wine glass sits on a man's lap. This just can't be accepted as proper behavior. Yet, somehow, Stain manages to show these negative examples without seeming condemnatory. He warns, yet also seems to have taken delight in depicting such impish children and wayward women. Stain's lively depiction of the young children, of the gorgeous fabrics, look for instance at the mistress of the house in that shot fabric, meaning the kind of changing colors in it and how beautifully that shows. And even of the tempting still life also causes us to associate the scene with pleasure more than warning. Perhaps too that is a warning, even indulgence in the pleasures of sight can lead people astray. Even today, by the way, there is a saying in Dutch talking about a Jan Steen household, and that means, of course, a household in absolute chaos with everything turned upside down. In this lecture, we've really focused on a number of scenes that have to do with uh, the representation of the human figure, whether in history subjects, St. Sebastian, the Judgment of Paris, in genre scenes, concerts, indoor scenes, such as uh, with Vermeer or Maas, these outdoor scenes with Stain and De Hoke. Now we need to move from the representation of the figure to the environment, also an important emphasis in Dutch painting of the 17th century. So now in the le next lecture, we will look at still life paintings, depictions of landscape, and a, a very particular specialty of the Dutch in the 17th century, architectural painting.